Thank you. It's been a wonderful conference and I'm very happy to be here. So what you can see there is a cartoon showing the, the fiscal cliff that we've uh, just negotiated and looming ahead of us is a much bigger cavern that's labelled climate. My training uh, is, I'm a glaciologist and I have a doctorate from the University of Washington in uh, Seattle and that better. <laughs> and 21 years ago I fell in love. I fell in love with an expansive snow-covered, completely awe-inspiring continent at the end of the earth. And that infatuation has continued till today and it defines my work. It's what motivates me to work for the Union of Concerned Scientists as an advocate for sound science. And I know that every person in this room is also motivated by that passion. And I think as scientists, we actually need to find that passion and communicate it. The Union of Concerned Scientists tells stories about scientists and we get scientists to tell stories about themselves because we know that narrative is incredibly powerful. People want to know why you do the work you do. People want to know how you got into it and that makes a connection with them. What we have here is a campaign we had a couple of years ago to basically elevate the public understanding of scientists. We took more than a dozen scientists, climate scientists, and made profiles of them, asked them why they, they do what they do, and we put out a national advertising campaign. So on the left here, you've got Julia Cole, who's a climate scientist who uh, spends a lot of time doing paleo climate in caves. And uh, down the bottom it says, I turned my passion for mud into an impassioned career. Now for those of you tweeting, <coughs> I challenge you to tweet as many of my <laughs> URLs as you can. We, we might even have a prize for the person who tweets the most. <laughs> Surveys show that less than 15% of the US general public know a climate scientist personally. So this was a way to elevate climate scientists and, and get them to become real people uh, to, the, to the public. I'm showing you a smorgasbord of what UCS does, uh, really so that we can use that to engage in discussion over the next half day. Another role we play is we push back on attacks on scientists. After the stolen emails from East Anglia, uh, we did a lot of press work and a lot of work behind the scenes in the US to make sure that the US press realised the mistakes that had been made in the coverage and we've also got a, gu a guide for scientists living in an age of scrutiny. These can be found at the table outside. Please take as many copies as you like. And once again, the tweeters. This is uh, science scientists under scrutiny. And that guide is, is meant to tell scientists how they can respond to criticism and personal attacks, how you can tell the difference between a legitimate request for information and a bad faith request that is trying to tie up your time or even to dent your reputation. Another key role that we play, and I think we do this very well, is we push back against the well-funded, intentional campaign of deception by the fossil fuel in industry that has been going on now for a couple of decades. There are many, many books written on this, and three weeks ago, our Director of Communications, Elliot Nagan, actually published a six-part series looking at the bias in the US media uh, that rarely uh, exposes the funding of a lot of the front groups. So I invite you to, once again, tweet. Uh, this is um, a very good series that outlines what's going on in the media here. We also published a report several years ago called Smoke, Mirror and Hot Air, and it outlined that the tobacco companies were using particular PR companies for their work that are now getting work with big oil and big coal. So this is the kind of atmosphere we find ourselves in as climate scientists. Uh, certainly the, the playing field is not level for us. We run workshops where we train scientists in communication. We try and put scientists on the front foot and uh, we don't actually engage in any of the content 
uh, discussion with contrarians. There are people in this audience who do that much better than we do. Uh, but we teach scientists to create talking points about their research and to be able to uh, discuss things with the public and the media. We like to empower our scientists and really the, the simplest talking points from global warming come down to four points. It's happening, it's caused by us, scientists agree about it and we have a choice about what we do. So while we're an advocacy organisation, we advocate for good science. We also do a lot of translation and outreach, particularly about uh, government reports. So the National Climate Assessment, we ran webinars earlier this year on the draft. Those PowerPoints are available, freely available for people to use. Uh, we will also uh, translate the IPCC findings in September. We've done that for each of the IPCC reports. So this is one of uh, our strengths, to be able to provide that interface between the hard science and the narrative and, and uh, information that people need in plain English. We've heard, uh, we've heard a lot in the last few days about how important scientists are, how trusted they are as messengers. And we realise that consensus is really important. But I want to bring to your attention one other thing about scientists is we're pretty weird. We're kind of unique. Whenever you do personality profiles, and Climatic Change published a paper in 2011 showing that the personality profiles of climate scientists in particular are quite different from the general public. There are some sniggers in the audience. What the research showed was using a Myers-Briggs personality profile, which you know, has its opponents and its supporters, that there are two key areas that interdisciplinary climate scientists differ from the general US public. And they're in the areas of intuition and sensing. So most of the people in this room are on the intuition end of the spectrum. We like relationships between ideas, we like the big picture, and we like patterns and recognition. Most of the US general public is way on the other end of the spectrum. They like sensing. So they like concrete examples, they like personal experience, and they need things that are local. And that's been pointed out a number of times in this conference, that our communication methods need to change. Now what we do at UCS is we actually don't just have scientists meeting with policymakers or the public. We often take a suite of people with us. We'll take an economist, we'll take a religious leader, and depending on the affiliation either of the audience or the policymaker, we'll take a priest, a rabbi, a nun. We'll also take a small business owner, and that suite of people will tell the story of climate change from very different perspectives, and it's quite powerful. So forming those alliances and coalitions is very important. We also use movie stars. So this was a series of ads that uh, Kevin Bacon and a number of other people did gratis several years ago. Not being much of a consumer of popular culture myself, I, uh, I didn't really engage with it, but apparently it was quite a splash. We also encourage scientists to tell stories, stories that are about solutions. That's a really powerful message. Uh, health risks, your personal passion, and also about the impacts that are already happening. Now the title of this session is about paradigms changing. One of the paradigms that we see changing is that the impacts are now already happening. The future is now. We no longer have to have these messages that are out at 2050 and 2100 to be locally resonant with people. People in Florida, Virginia, they're seeing sea level rise. People in Colorado are seeing wildfires and drought. We ran some focus groups just a month ago and we brought people of many political persuasions into the room to actually have discussion with each other. The sessions ran, ran for about eight hours and in these viewpoint dialogues we found that one of the ways to broach the partisan nature of climate was actually just not to use the words climate change, global warming or climate science. We went straight to sea level rise, drought and wildfires 
and people who came into the room saying they didn't believe in global warming left the room saying they weren't sure but they thought we needed to do something about it. So this was an incredible watershed moment for us because it gives us an opportunity to stop making people make a tribal choice. So we are tribal and it's not very easy to tra change your tribe. It's much easier if someone gives you permission to sit on the fence. So I think we need to be careful about forcing people to either believe in climate change or not. Maybe it's not that important. As long as they realise there's something wrong, something's going on that needs addressing, uh, it might be enough. Some of the materials, I'll give you an example of a few of them. We specialise in infographics, so again the tweeters can go mad. This is one we released re recently looking at uh, sea level rise. This is one that we put out about extreme weather. Now this came up several weeks ago when we had statements from Christie, White House, Boxer, Lamar Smith. They were all getting it wrong. So UCS took everybody to task and said there are some things we're very certain of. They're things like extreme heat, uh, extreme precipitation, severe droughts, coastal flooding from sea level rise. These are the things that science can attribute to climate change. The things we know less about are hurricanes and tornadoes. So we always bring people back to the science and we hope we do it well. And uh, these infographics, again, are all available on our website. One of our most popular images has been a series of migrating climates. We've used these in a number of state reports. And what they show, they show two different emission scenarios. A lower emission scenario where we choose to have a future where we invest in renewables and we decrease our emissions. It's, uh, it's the B1 scenario from the IPCC ESRES. And a higher emission scenario where we continue on business as usual, which used to be the A1 uh, ESRES. And what you see is that where those states move in mid-century and end of century tells you the, the kind of summers you would have in that state uh, under those emission scenarios. And I can tell you, when I go to Illinois and tell them that their children will be retiring in Texas, they're not very happy. So this was a, a very uh, graphic way of showing people that we have choices. We actually don't need to have a climate that's like Texas in Illinois by the end of the century. So we have a whole range of these on our website. We use graphs sparingly. I think somebody had a, a big cross through a graph earlier this week. Most people's eyes glaze over when they look at this, unless it's very well presented or very simple to pick out what you, you want to look at. We also have plenty of local information. We have a climate hot map and we are putting more and more local impacts that we're already seeing on that hot map. So it's a repository of information. We're still figuring out what to do with local me the new media. We still write opinion editorials, but now we blog, we tweet, we have Facebook, etc. The tweeters can send out our blog. Uh, we do have 30 staff that blog. Our blog is called The Equation. And it's actually turning into a really good rapid response tool. So there was a, an appalling op-ed in The Australian a couple of months ago. Uh, it was a Murdoch paper, and it was suggesting that climate scientists be put to death. We thought this was a little over the top, and we responded with a, a blog. We've also had uh, the 400 ppm mark going over carbon dioxide in there. And most recently, we're looking at uh, how the military is looking at sea level rise in Virginia. So this has been a very good tool for us. Uh, just some lessons learned. Communicate with passion. We need stories. We're important, but there are a lot of other people out there who are messengers who are also important. We're not on a level playing field. Big coal and big oil are still out there. We think that focusing on impacts may make the partisan debate less uh, relevant. 
and uh, we're still experimenting with new opportunities. Just to finish, we have a science network of 20,000 experts. If you'd like to become involved, uh, please go to the, the URL there. Uh, we have the talking guide, talking with the media. These are available out the back. And uh, UCS, for those of you who don't know, uh, is a, a non-profit. We have 400,000 supporters. So if you'd like to know more, please come and talk to me. Thanks.